Within Woodlawn Cemetery in Forest Park, on the north side of Cermak Road and not far from the North Riverside Mall, is a section of burial plots bounded by four identical white stone monuments. Each one is in the shape of an elephant. In 1918, there was a derailment of a circus train a few miles outside of Hammond, Indiana, and most of the performers from that crash got buried here. There's been the occasional new addition ever since. I guess not everybody who runs away to be a fire breather wants to go back to Kansas posthumously. There are names on the new tombstones, but most of the old ones have a combination of numbers and nicknames. Baldy, fat man number three. <laughs> Taking a stroll among the elephants is a teenage girl in a black dress and black tights. The tights have little white skulls on them and the girl's wearing pale green lipstick. This is Maggie. I know Maggie. Maggie believes that she is sensitive to the spirits of the departed. This is not the case. I could do jumping jacks an inch in front of Maggie's nose all day long and she would not notice. This is not a knock on her. I will not hear a disparaging word about Maggie who gets good grades and is nice to people and is patient with her autistic little brother and writes poetry that is not actually all that bad for someone her age. But she doesn't have the knack. It was a relief to tell the boss that. One of the brunettes, the brunette is his boss, one of the brunette's recent policy changes is a crackdown on unauthorized contact between dead and the living. With regard to the dead, this is mostly just a matter of making the rules known and enforcing them. With regard to the living, the situation is more complicated. The continuum between getting a weird feeling when a ghost is in the room on one side and actually being able to see and talk to them on the other is a little like musical talent. On the left, we have perfect pitch, the thing that happens sometimes and is not a huge deal. On the other, we have those once-in-a-lifetime kids that sit down at the piano and start playing Mozart without ever getting a lesson. They're rare, but they happen. And if it might be happening, the word from on high is that we need to take a close look. So when Maggie started telling people she could see dead people everywhere, I followed her around until I was sure she was just being a teenager. That happened a while ago. As happy as I am to see Maggie, she's not the reason I've been dispatched. There's another girl on the other end of the cemetery doing the same long, lazy walk that Maggie's been doing. They give each other space, like big cats, each claiming opposite sides of the jungle. The other girl has a destination. She takes her time getting there. Every loop around the tombstone seems to drag her somewhere deeper inside herself. She's big and has broad shoulders, fat over muscle. From a distance, it would be a tough guess at her gender, but she's wearing a pink winter hat and there's a part of a long blonde braid that pokes out from under it before it disappears again under her coat collar. Aside from the hat, what she's wearing is mostly black and gray and Walmart cheap, sweatpants on top of sweatpants. She gets to where she's been going and has to work up some courage before she approaches the grave. It has a woman's name on it. She died a few months ago and was born 18 years before that. The girl in the pink hat kneels down. It takes visible effort. She throws herself onto the dirt. She kneels and cries, and it all comes out of her in a rush. It's her big sister. That's the grave she's visiting. The girl in the pink hat talks so fast that I can't make out everything she's saying. She hates her parents and her school and her friends, which she doesn't have, and then it goes back to her parents. She runs laps. Her rant goes on for long enough that I tune out a little bit. Then she pulls a knife out of her waistband and holds it in front of her. I have no eyelids to close. I could look away but manage not to. She lifts her other hand and cuts a line diagonally across her palm. The blood gushes and swells. She makes a fist and it drips. She makes a big X on the ground like Jackson Pollock. Nothing complicated, just one sloppy line crossing another. I can hear her breathing now that I'm close. She's greedy and serious. This is her heir, nobody else's. She'll tear out the throat of anybody who tries to separate her from it. At this point, I'm thinking I'm just about done here. This young woman has not spent years learning dead languages and digging through ancient tombs in search of forbidden rituals. She's a cutter with a sense of the dramatic. It's a shame, but it's not my problem, and thank God. I'm a good talker, but I'm not a social worker, and I don't envy whoever it is that ends up having to clean up the mess here. I stand up, and then so does she. She whirls around, like somebody tapped her on the shoulder and caught her by surprise. I take a step backwards. She's still looking around, wondering if she imagined it. I don't have that luxury. The timing was too perfect. She didn't imagine something, she felt something. She felt me. She can't see me, but for a moment she knew I was there. 
This complicates the situation. And that's it. Thank you so much.